Welcome everyone to the virtual ACRP 2020 part two. We're very excited to have you with us today. My name is Michael Causey. I'm the editor in chief here at ACRP. Uh, we've gonna have, we're gonna have a total of 24 sessions throughout this whole event. And those of you who've participated in this already know the drill, six tracks over 10 weeks, 24 ACRP contact hours available uh, if you participate in the entire event. Today's track is gonna be a good one, study management and conduct part one. We'll be going four sessions today, ending, ending the day right about 3.45. Our first session today is going to be a really good one, Patients First, Building Compassion and Research. I've had the opportunity to speak with all three of these panelists at different times and work closely with them on many different things. And I can assure you, they really know their stuff. They tell their stories really well. Uh, before we jump to the session, and I'll let Jennifer take over in just a second, but let me tell everyone that our session today will go about an hour uh, we can go a little bit over, but there we'll go till about noon. Jennifer will handle the questions at the end of the session. Then I'll come back on and tell you about the rest of the day. Our following session is at 1215, improving alignment and risk management approaches across pharma, CRO, and site relations. So stick around for that one at 1215. But let me first tell you our session today, we've got Jennifer Byrne, who's the CEO of Javara Inc., Dr. David Zas, who's an MBA and chief executive officer for the Charleston Division and the Chief Clinical Officer for MUSC Health, Medical University of South Carolina, and TJ Sharp, Patient Advisor with Starfish Harbor. Again, a real pleasure to see all three of you. Thank you so much for joining us this morning and kicking us off in such high style. Jennifer, take it away. Thanks again. Thanks, Michael. Well, hello, everybody, and uh, welcome to October, and welcome to our session. Uh, when we first started planning this session, you know, it was pre-COVID and we were really excited about um, being on stage and really sharing the space with everybody in Seattle. But um, more years to come and more opportunities to come, but nevertheless, um, does not dull the, um, I think, the significance of this time together that we will have with uh, Dr. David Zoss and TJ Sharp. Um, in planning for this this session, I thought it was amazing, honestly, you know, um, the topic about compassion. Uh, I don't know from all the conferences that I've attended and different programs that really boiling it down to a discussion and time centered on compassion. We talk about patient centricity um, oftentimes and in many different venues, but I think really, you know, narrowing on this topic of compassion and as I was thinking about preparing for, um, you know, launching into setting the stage for uh, the stories coming from both Dr. Um, David Zoss and TJ Sharp, um, but, you know, I was thinking, you know, why compassion uh, specifically? And, um, you know, there's empathy. I think it's something that we, you know, all feel, but what, what really is, is kind of the pivot point for a focused discussion on compassion. And, and so by definition, just wanted to share with you all, there actually is a difference. So compassion is not the same as empathy or altruism, though the concepts are related. While empathy refers more generally to our ability to take the perspective of and feel the emotions of another person, compassion is when those feelings and thoughts include the desire to actually help. So compassion is really more a movement to action. And I think that that's probably something that within this audience, we are all here for that very reason. So I, I, I am um, imagining that we are very united in terms of a journey forward for compassion. So um, with that, um, you know, today we're really going to, again, center the conversation and be reminded, you know, I think we've got an hour as, as professionals, busy professionals working in this very complicated and complex clinical trials development process. Now in the midst of pandemic, um, you know, there's just a lot of busyness. And certainly, um, and thankfully, I think we um, spend um, a lot of time within our companies and building out programs and technologies around the patient journey, um, but still in the busyness of, of the world that we lead, sometimes it is a little easy to really lose sight of um, what an individual human beings 
um, experience is. Uh, so again, we're going to have an opportunity to hear two very unique perspectives um, and go a little bit deeper in terms of personal journey. And before handing off um, to our esteemed guest today, I wanted to just share with you a very personal uh, part of my own journey. So um, again, I'm Jennifer Byrne. I have been in the clinical research space for a very, very long time. I've always worked on the side of the patient and working with doctors um, to facilitate clinical research. Um, I have been a patient participant. Um, I wouldn't say that I have been a patient participant when the chips have really been down uh, for me from a health standpoint, but I have had an opportunity to participate in research. I've had family members who have been in clinical trials, life and death, uh, and I've had friends. And more recently, um, I want to just share with you just kind of a snippet because it's given me, um, I think, even maybe a, a, a little um, different perspective on compassion and action. And I have a very good personal friend. And about five years ago, we were soccer moms together and then became runner, runner mom friends together. And about five years ago, after one of our Saturday morning runs, um, my friend Mary fell ill and was shortly thereafter diagnosed with um, breast cancer and um, spent about a year going through really standard of care. So she went through, um, you know, all the standard chemotherapy, surgery, radiation, and she was a trooper. In fact, every single day she had radiation. She walked a mile and a half to the facility for her treatment, would walk home, and maintained, um, you know, really overall uh, great out outlook and quality of life went into remission and about two years ago had a recurrence. And when her breast cancer recurred, it came back with a vengeance, stage four, very advanced in her spinal cord, in her lungs. And at that moment in time, um, you know, Mary knew that it was very serious. So Mary sought out, um, you know, um, medical, um, even even second um, second opinions and went to major cancer center and was actually offered a clinical trial, but the clinical trial was going to require that she relocate to Houston. And at that point in time, she was really given a prognosis that you know perhaps she had as much as twelve months um, to live. And so the idea of going to Houston, relocating being away from her family, leaving work was really not a good option for Mary. So Mary decided to pass on that and uh, was offered some, you know, um, additional uh, treatments that would be really uh, hopefully somewhat uh, prolong her life, but certainly not a, a cure. Um, so Mary went back to kind of standard treatment and that ensued for another, you know, period of time. And then a little over a year ago, the day came that Mary went back for her usual checkup and scans and, and the cancer was progressing. And at that moment in time, Mary was really told, you know, there's nothing else that I can do for you. And this was coming from her doctor, well-trained, um, excellent physician, in, in the practice of medicine for all the right reasons with a very reputable institution. But at that moment in time, imagine that being told, there's nothing else I can do for you. So, you know, because Mary's not the average person, Mary has a clinical research friend <laughs> that, you know, many people don't necessarily have a clinical research friend who's been in the business for 30 plus years. And when Mary told me, you know, there's nothing else that can be done for me, um, I said, well, what does that mean? Does that mean the doctor doesn't know what else to do for you? Is it that the institution doesn't have another offering for you? Or is there not anything else in the world to be done for you? To which Mary connected to a registry. And um, from there, eventually matched to over 80 potential clinical trials. So 
I just share this with you because I think that's a really interesting and for me kind of step, stop me dead in my tracks, having that conversation, being told there's nothing else that can be done for you. And again, I, I ask that question, is it, is, is that mean that there's nothing else at your fingertips that can be done, nothing else within your institution or absolutely nothing else in the world. And in a world where we're living with 7,000 drugs and devices in the development pipeline, but still having a hard time making those connections. Uh, in the case of Mary, over 80 potential matches came up. Fast forward to more recently, Mary has actually gone into a clinical trial. She's in a phase one clinical trial. And Mary went into that trial, entered that trial, took a while to, to, to trials put on hold. There were all sorts of uh, you know, administrative issues that caused some delays. But nevertheless, Mary entered the trial a few months ago. Phase one trial. And guess what? Mary is responding. It's amazing. And Mary, Mary's tumors are diminishing in size. But here, here is the point. Mary entered this trial three months ago with hope. Hope for Mary. I, I met with Mary two weeks ago. And this is, this is where things have, have changed for me, forever changed for me. Mary basically said, Jennifer, even if this is the drug, wave the magic wand and tomorrow my cancer is completely gone. I have battled this for all these years. I have irreparable heart damage. My lungs are a wreck. My bones are brittle. I have no quality of life. So I'm, I'm ready to go. And I said, and, the, the medication, while it's, it is working effectively for Mary in terms of tumor reduction and size of tumors, Mary's quality of life continues to rapidly decline. She has side effects. The medication itself, while clinically and by scientific standards, is, I think, deemed to be a success. From a personal standpoint, it's coming at great hardship for Mary. But here's the thing, and, and I've used the word medical hero, I can't, hundreds of times, hundreds of times. And it really wasn't until this moment two weeks ago in my conversation with Mary that I actually saw that here's an individual who went into a trial from a very personal standpoint for hope, and that has now pivoted. And Mary actually sees that her part of her legacy and part of how her life can really count in a way that Mary can make her life count in a way that she's maybe not going to have years is by sticking it out in this clinical trial. And that, you know, for, for me, really um, hit home in a way that, um, you know, never has before because I haven't necessarily walked in those shoes. So with that, I mean, I think my story is one story, but it's still really second. It's a, it's a second tier story. Um, we now have, I think, a wonderful opportunity to hear firsthand. And so with that, Dr. Zoss, uh, thank you for being here. And on behalf of the entire audience, I'm just going to say uh, for all of us, for both you and TJ, I just have to say we owe you a debt of gratitude. Um, in terms of your clinical trial experience and participation and contribution. So thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Jennifer. And thank you to uh, everyone for the opportunity. When we were getting ready for today, one of the questions that we discussed is, you know, why are we telling our story? Um, and I want to start a little bit there. Um, before I tell you, right, I'm fortunate to be alive today for many reasons. Um, I'm fortunate due to outstanding clinicians, uh, amazing science and innovation through a family and a support network, through access to clinical trials and, and innovation. And as I tell my story over the last four years, every day I wake up realizing how fortunate I was to have the outcome that I did. While there's similarities to Mary's story, 
um, I've been able to not only survive my battle against cancer, um, but I'm now sort of thriving, leading uh, and continuing on. So I really appreciate the, the chance and I hope there's at least a few points that realizes the impact that we make on people's lives every day that as a physician and a scientist and as a leader, I never appreciated until I was actually a patient. So uh, again, I could take way too much of our, our time to, to tell the stories, but uh, I'm gonna skip through uh, the first 45 years of my life really, really quickly, right? I was the typical type A, uh, very driven, motivated college medical school, met my wife in medical school and residency and fellowship and had amazing mentors and built an academic career as a physician scientist and trained at Duke and Hopkins and had been on faculty at Duke for almost 20 years. Uh, built a national and international reputation in lung transplant uh, and clinical research uh, from the delivery side uh, and enrolling patients uh, in really innovative therapies. Like many physicians, I probably thought I was invincible. Uh, I didn't have a primary care doctor. I was 45 and healthy. There was no reason to do anything for primary care or, or prevention. And I probably never imagined I'd be a sick a day in my life. I had four to six weeks where I knew something was wrong. I was developing shortness of breath. I had developed a skin rash. My gums were bothering me. I remember intentionally hiding that from my wife, realizing that I knew something was wrong. I had two young kids. They were 11 and 13. I remember trying to go skiing with them and realizing how hard it was to walk uh, at the altitude and feeling like I had fevers that night. It was Valentine's Day of 2017. I remember walking into work, still too stubborn to, to see a doctor, but asking a friend and a cardiologist to draw labs because I knew I had leukemia. I knew based on my clinical findings that I had diagnosed myself with a life-threatening disease. He dismissed it, uh, a good friend who I love to this day, uh, but agreed to draw the labs. Nobody checked him for the next three days. Nobody really thought I was sick. When those labs were released to me as the patient, unfortunately, I was correct. I had my hemoglobin had dropped to six. I had severe anemia. It was clear that my diagnosis was right. Unlike so many of my patients, right, I had amazing access. I was able to call a friend who's a leukemia specialist. I was able to get seen the next day. He confirmed my diagnosis of acute myeloid leukemia. I was in blast crisis. I had every poor prognostic sign that anyone could have in terms of skin findings, bad genetics, and very, very advanced disease by the time I presented. He's an amazing clinician and a good friend, and I'll never forget the words as he walked into the room, which was probably one of his most difficult days to tell me that I had acute myeloid leukemia. As a physician and an NIH-funded scientist, my first question, is there research? Is there new drugs? I'll never forget the quote, the treatment hasn't changed for 30 years. The survival is less than 20%. You're young, you're otherwise healthy. We can give you really high dose chemotherapy and we can assess what we're gonna do going forward. I looked at my wife that night. Uh, I insisted on going home one evening before we went to get, to get admitted to the hospital. I said, I'm gonna figure out how to tell our two sons that I have leukemia and figure out what to say. Uh, I was no longer a physician. I asked her to figure out what was next, but I was grasping at straws with the potential of looking at high dose chemotherapy and a really poor prognosis. Again, I was really fortunate. After medical school residency fellowship, we had a national network. We were able to identify a phase one research trial at Johns Hopkins run by several colleagues that I had trained with 20 years earlier ending a phase one trial of a class of drugs that had no, never been FDA approved. We've always been easy to make decisions. We left Duke quickly. We moved up to Hopkins that evening. I remember arriving on the inpatient unit at one in the morning. As a physician, I loved working nights. As an ICU physician, I used to work nights and weekends. 
walking into the hospital as a patient that night was a totally different perspective that I will never forget. My oncologist came in at 1 a.m., described to me what we were doing that night. He identified that we were going to enroll in a phase one trial that he was really excited about, that we were going to look at low-dose chemotherapy combined with a study drug and a really quickly transition to bone marrow transplants. Over the next six months, I was away from home. Similar to the questions that Jennifer was talking about with Mary, I left my kids and asked my parents to step in. My wife would commute back between Durham and and Hopkins and Baltimore at least twice a week, back and forth to try to take care of the kids, try to keep her job, and to try to support me. I spent 74 days as an inpatient, multiple hospital complications, amazing team members. We see, especially pre-COVID, so many stories of the problems in healthcare. Again, I was fortunate. The healthcare I had was outstanding. Not only the compassion of the clinicians, the opportunity to get cared for by residents and students uh, and learners, but just the compassion of the team. And as a hospital leader now, I think of so many of those moments. Alicia cleaned my room probably 80% of those night days that I was there. I remember her smile, her detail that she cleaned because with my worries around having no immune system, the compassion as the environmental services team member who knew what I needed and what were my fears. John, who delivered the food and the trays because all I could eat was milkshakes. And he knew every night I would order a vanilla milkshake with Oreo cookies because that was the only thing that I was going to be able to get down. Uh, But being there alone for over two months, I so appreciated their compassion and that connection that they made in those moments in addition to the unbelievable care uh, that they provided. Again, I was really fortunate. I had a 13-year-old son, just old enough to be a donation marrow donor. I didn't need to go through a registry network and try to find a match. My 13-year-old son realized he was going to be the hero in the story. He was going to be the bone marrow donor that would save my life with a bone marrow transplant in May of 2017. I was fortunate that bone marrow transplant was outpatient. For those that know me, I'm exceptionally stubborn, uh, and my motivation didn't stop. I walked five miles a day as an inpatient. I never would sit in my hospital bed before it said between 7 a.m. and 9 p.m. I never got hospitalized afterwards, and I drove myself to every single clinic visit. They said I could go back to work at day 90 to 120. I returned back to work at day 55. I have not missed a day of work since August of 17. I am now fortunate not only to have beaten leukemia, but I truly believe it is improved both my family and me as an individual in so many different ways. I look back and I truly uh, and sincerely say that I've been given the gift of the chance to not only have this battle, but to come through on the other side stronger than I was in the beginning. My kids will be better from having to go through adversity They spent months scared they were going to lose their father, seeing me sick, seeing me in the hospital. My my, my 17-year-old, who was the donor now, to this day still worries that if I get sick, is it his fault? Is it his marrow that isn't good enough? As everyone's told him, he saved his dad's life. My wife's a physician scientist as well. I spent 18 months on a phase one study drug. That class of drug subsequently got breakthrough approval by the FDA. It is now one of the most commonly used drugs in acute myeloid leukemia with foot three mutations that I happen to have. As a scientist, I know I can't prove whether I'm alive because of it or not. But my wife and I will tell you, we're convinced that the opportunity from that phase one trial and the opportunity to have that drug is why I'm alive today. 
And not only am I alive, but I don't have significant complications relative to the transplant, the chemotherapy, the radiation that I was able to, had to go through at the time. Fast forward to today. It's now three and a half years since I had the bone marrow transplant coming up on my four year anniversary from diagnosis. I know I'm not out of the woods, especially after my treatment and others, I probably have five years before I really think that my recurrence risk is low. I truly don't worry about it. I really have never felt the appreciation for the chances that I've been given. The compassion that was demonstrated by my family of my parents' willingness to move and care for my kids. And the, again, how much closer have they become as a family? My wife's willingness to care for our kids, our house, and me in different cities for six months. Amazing physicians at Duke and Hopkins that understand the choices I made to follow the opportunity for research. Amazing thought leader physicians that, had the, uh, that gave me that opportunity to get a slot in a phase one trial that so many of my patients wouldn't have a chance to do. I feel an obligation. How am I gonna be a better leader today? I now lead a $2 billion organization, 11,000 employees, almost 1,000 physicians within our campus here. Two weeks ago was Environmental Services Week. I spent four hours with our teams on different shifts, nights, weekends, day shift, sharing the stories around how they can make an impact. That it's not just the clinical nurses and physicians and share the story of the impact that Alicia made on me. I lead differently uh, in how I interact with my teams and recognize that we have a privilege to do what we do every day. This week is the first week that I'm taking care of patients since I was sick. I haven't actually been back in a doctor since 2016. This is the first week that I've been back taking care of patients with heart transplant, lung transplant, and other complications, including a patient who was recently diagnosed with AML getting ready for her own bone marrow transplant. It's a gift that I've been given this chance to share this story. I want to end with just a few comments around the impact of research. In some ways, I'm embarrassed to say that as a clinical researcher and a physician, I recognized, you know, that the patients were selfless. And when they were enrolling in research, they were really helping us as a medical community. They were helping future patients. I'll say as a patient, I have a different perspective on clinical research. As a patient, I was doing that research because I wanted to see my kids grow up but I knew I didn't want to die and I was going to do everything I could to survive. And it was not selfless. It was selfish. I needed that hope. I needed that lifeline that I was going to have to do everything I could, everything I could. And I think it's really important. And I say this to my team when we now look at how do we expand clinical research, not only in our an academic medical center, but across the state. How do we realize that offering patients access to clinical research is patient centered? And it's critical for their ability to really believe they've done everything they can to achieve their goals. So I'm fortunate that the trial that I was on and the drug and it contributed to hopefully so many others have benefited. But as a patient, I was doing it for myself. I was doing it because I wanted to live and that was the best opportunity that I had. And my goal today as a physician and as a hospital and health system leader is every patient should be as fortunate as I was. Every patient should have access. That means how do we address insurance? How do we address transportation? How do we address family support? Every patient should have access to not only the highest quality care, but the compassionate team members that I had that supported me throughout those 74 days in the hospital. And every patient should have access to research and innovation, especially when they're facing diseases and challenges where we know the prognosis is poor and they want to continue to fight and they want to continue to, to try.
So I appreciate the chance to to share my story. For those that know me, I probably could keep going for uh, another two hours uh, of anecdotes, um, but really appreciate that and uh, want to keep us moving so we have time for discussion at the end, which is more fun than, than listening to my monologue. So I'm going to pass it to, to TJ next. Thanks, Dr. Das. And I, I don't know, I'm torn. Part of me wants you to keep talking because it's such an engaging story. If we were in front of everybody live at the ACRP conference, I'd ask everyone to stand up and clap if they wanted to hear more of your story. Uh, but part of me is a little, a little uh, conflicted because this is your first week back and there are patients that need you. And I, I can only imagine how much that means to you uh, as, as a patient and as someone who's been through a number of the same things that you've been through. I started writing notes. And I went, wow, I did that too. I did that too. So um, thanks for having me sort of anchor this uh, relay leg of stories. I'm going to give you a very brief uh, version of my story, uh, which is going to sound very similar to the two that you just heard. Uh, and I'll, I'll try to highlight some of the things that, that maybe are common between the stories that are threads that we see that, that you as clinical research professionals can take from these different examples and bring back to, to, to your practice, your clinic. Um, when I was 25 years old, I was diagnosed uh, with a stage one melanoma right up here in my clavicle. Uh, it was a little mole I couldn't see. And I was at the Jersey Shore Plenty and I went to the dermatologist and said, just take this off, please. And, and please tell my mother and my girlfriend, it's not a big deal. And that dermatologist called me back two days later saying, you need to go to NYU Medical Center and not believe everything you read on the internet about melanoma. Uh, I realized I just became a young adult cancer patient after I went home and Googled what melanoma was. Uh, I was not in, um, in pre-med at the time. I, I was 25 at, as an IT project manager. And now I was a young adult cancer patient. And I did what I thought every cancer patient should do after I got the, 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 the cancer removed. I did things like wear floppy hats and sunscreen and, and big long sleeve shirts. Um, but I also moved to Florida, which may have been questionable. And it was a great move. That's where I, I met my wife and, and I had my first daughter. And in, in 2012, we had our, our son, Tommy. And we we're a happy family of four, a seemingly healthy family of four. And four weeks after Tommy was born, I went back to the same hospital he was born in with what I thought was a spiking fever. Now, I didn't know to diagnose myself with cancer, um, but the, the uh, ER doctor took one look at my, my, uh, my chest x-ray and said, with your history of melanoma and, and these spots we see on your lung, I'm afraid you have a recurrence of your cancer. I was in disbelief. I thought I was going there for a few hours, maybe overnight, and I ended up leaving that hospital 16 days later. I had one eight, ten, ugh, one eight centimeter tumor removed from my small bowel, and I had other tumors spread across both my lungs, my liver, and my spleen. Uh, for me, uh, much like Dr. Zoss, I wanted a chance to see my kids grow up. I was, uh, I was certainly selfish in, in, my, in my decision to find treatment, but I wasn't offered a, clinic, a chance at a clinical trial. The, the first doctor walked in. Uh, after we had had my surgery, and basically said to me, I'll be surprised if you're here in two years. Well, that wasn't going to be good enough. That basically told me I was never going to see my kids go to kindergarten. Well, fortunately for me, uh, melanoma was at the forefront of this new, amazing, potentially amazing uh, breakthrough in cancer research called immunotherapy uh, that had sat back in the, in the background for years. And I had a, a few friends help me navigate to, uh, to a, an excellent physician uh, like Dr. Sass that was doing a couple different clinical trials. I actually had a chance to, to, to or the choice to enroll in one of two. Uh, the first one was for uh, these new type of checkpoint inhibitors uh, called anti-PD-1 drugs. Uh, sounded good. The second one uh, was, a, was a, a CAR T cell therapy uh, that used your own T cells to uh, attack and fight cancer, and it, and it was followed up with high dose outs to a really involved, almost personalized treatment. So that was the one that really, I, it really sounded good to me. I, I wanted that one. Like, give me, the, that's like the Star Trek type medicine, you know, the, the personalized medicine. Give me that. I want to give it a shot. Let my body heal itself. 
And as sort of an afterthought, I asked the, my oncologist, said, how have other people done on this? I mean, you probably know that, right? And he said, well, as far as we know, you're the first person to try this therapy, this, this combination of therapies in this sequence. And I said, oh, okay. So you're telling me that no one has ever failed this before. I, I think we need to give this a shot. My, uh, my enthusiasm for the clinical research uh, was, was kind of provided to me by a background. I did work in, in life sciences and in pharmaceuticals as an IT person, and I understood what clinical trials were. They were things that other people did to get medicines approved. Uh, I never thought that I would be the person that would need or want to be involved in clinical research, but yet here I was, and I was faced with the decision, uh, take standard of care chemotherapy, which had a median 18 month lifespan, or try this new therapy, try these new combination of therapies that use your own cells uh, with you. And I did, and, and there was a number of hurdles that we went through. Uh, I, I know some of you have probably heard this part of the story before, the, uh, the, the benefit of being the first patient in trial is that you're getting them, you're there, everybody's ready and, and willing and the, everyone's interested and invested in your, in your, in your, uh, in your therapy. They're, they're, they want to see what's going to happen. The problem is, is that before you can start a clinical trial, there's a whole little contract that needs to get signed and mine wasn't. So I was waiting and ready for this, this treatment, uh, this trial, uh, this TIL trial that I, I, I couldn't wait to be on. And it's going to save my life and, and, and watch my kids grow up to be teenagers. It wasn't signed. And after a week and two weeks and then four weeks, I ended up having to call one of the sponsor companies. My, 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 my oncologist said, look, I'm sorry. I, there's nothing I can do about this. This is with the lawyers. I'm sure many of you out there had to deal with hurdles like this at one point in your career. So I called the sponsor and I point blank said, what, what is going on? I, what I actually said was I'm a cancer patient and I have a concern about one of your clinical trial drugs. And that got me right to the lawyers for the pharmaceutical company. And the woman I talked to was really sweet and really compassionate. Uh, or Maybe empathetic is the word uh, that I should use now, Jennifer, uh, because she understood and, and really had that empathy. But then couldn't do anything about it. So I'm sorry, your 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 document's still being processed. And I told her, for you, this is a document, but for me, this is my life, and I'm not going to wait around and lose my best chance of watching my son grow up or, or walking my daughter down the aisle at her wedding uh, because your piece of paper isn't signed. And so she said, "Well, can can I get back to you, please?" Uh, and a couple of days later, that trial started. Uh, and I'd like to say that's where the happy ending happened. And and we have a we have a happy ending, but it, it didn't. And I I did not uh, do well in the trial. Uh, my tumors progressed, but I was fortunate that I found a second trial for uh, the anti P one drug that I mentioned earlier. And uh, four years after, almost four years after starting on my second clinical trial, uh, I received my seventy fifth and final dose of uh, what is now known as Keytruda. Uh, and the reason we stopped was I finally got a scan report that said malign malignant disease is not suspected. For the first time in five years, someone told me they didn't think I had cancer. And that was a pretty cool feeling. Uh, I, I think I understand a lot of things that, that Jennifer's friend Mary uh, felt along the way that you don't know how much more you can take. I think I felt the same resolve Dr. Asas felt that I want to be here for my kids and and I, and I felt the support of, of my wife and my family. My parents did the same thing. And they, you know, they watched my kids, but they were changing diapers at the time. Uh, so there, there's all these, these commonalities between our stories. And I don't think that we should lose sight that the people that you're working with, you're working for, uh, they're people. They're humans. They're part of a family. Uh, you know, the, the number of things I have on here are, you know, you know I want to tell Dr. Zoss, yeah, when, you, when you're that patient, go have that Oreo shake because that's that's part of what it takes to be a, a patient and donate your time and your biology so that others can can benefit. Um, I understand the 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 need to you know, feel very uh, to feel very uh, selfish, for lack of a better word, because I wanted to get better too. 
Uh, but I think that the sense of altruism hit me. Um, my, my role now isn't, uh, it certainly isn't an IT person. Uh, I, I became a patient advocate. Um, I have become an advisor to, to a number of pharmaceutical and people in the clinical research world. And just last month, uh, I started a, a full-time position as, as the director of, of, of patient engagement. No, the program director. Program Manager of Patient Engagement. I don't even know my own title. That's how new it is. Uh, at Metadata Solutions. So I'm working in the industry now. Part of what I have that calling is that I want to get back to, you know, my, my patients are are not the ones that, that, that Dr. Sassi is, but are the, the other people who are going to hear one day, uh, you have cancer and not know what to do. And they might read a blog or call a friend and say, Hey, I just got diagnosed. And like, Hey, this, this guy, TJ had this crazy experience. Maybe you should give him a shot, a shout and help them or navigate their journey or set up the systems that we're going to help other patients. That's part of what I do now. Uh, I think the way I know we're, we're trying to get a few extra minutes here, uh, for, for, for time, I think are important for you to think about, uh, that, that sense of I I'm, I want to be involved in this because it's everything I, I want to do. That altruism that, that is followed by a sense of altruism as well. I've talked to hundreds of, of patients and dozens of trial participants, and there's there's always two main themes. I want to get better. I want to do something that's going to make me feel better, be healthier, whatever whatever their health journey goals are. But I want to give back. And a good friend of mine's father was, was part of a, of a CAR T cell therapy. And of the 20 patients, 19 had 19 were finished the trial. He was the one that passed away from, a, from, a, from a side effect. And when he was going in, he told her, he said, look, I know this is a possibility. But this is what I want to do. If I'm going to have a legacy, I want it to be part of that. I don't want to just make myself better. I want others to be better. And that that altruism that that does sit with many of, of, of us who participate in clinical trials because we want to make the world a better place. So as you go through your your, your day, uh, remember that the people there uh, they're they're looking to you for a smile to keep your room clean so you. Your immune system. I, I had a compromised immune system too at one point, and I remember having to, to cook everything and wash the vegetable. Like those little things mean so much to the patients who, who are volunteering their time and, and their families who, who drive back and forth several hours and maintain two houses. We, you know, we moved our family four hours away. Uh, that was a sacrifice for us, and we we're fortunate we can do it. Dr. Soss made a great point that why can't that happen for everyone? Why can't we bring our medicines to everyone? Uh, but that's, that's another, that's another presentation, maybe later today or next year. Uh, the, the final story I'll leave you with isn't one of mine. It's, it's another melanoma advocates. And I think it's going to kind of maybe bring all this together. Uh, she was also a melanoma till patient and she received her treatment at the NIH under Dr. Steven Rosenberg, who's the forefather of, of T cell therapies. And he took, he did one thing that I can't, I wasn't there, but I'll never forget her telling the story. He took a picture of her little baby boy, Kai. And he brought it around before she got to there for her, for her T-cell therapy the, night, the day before, the, the Friday before, whatever it was. And he took it to every single person who was going to be involved in her treatment, whether they saw her or not. Every nurse, every administrator, every, the, the person who checked her in, the, the, the nurse who drew blood. Everyone who she would interact with or would be involved in her trial, every person saw that picture of little Kai. And he said to each of those people, we're going to make this little boy's mom better. And that's the attitude. If an esteemed researcher like Dr. Rosenberg sees that, that's what I hope that we can do as advocates to pass down to you. Because that's the impact you make on people's lives. You make us healthier. You, you, you allow us to live longer and you give our families that hope that Dr. Zoss spoke of 
that we're going to one day be able to give back, to pass forward, to pay it forward, so that someone else is going to hear you have cancer, they have a little more hope than maybe we did. With that, I'm going to end this little 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 story, uh, and and certainly thank Dr. Sass and, and Jennifer and the ACRP for allowing all of us to tell a little bit of our stories. And and I think now we're we're ready to take a few questions and have a, a quick discussion. Great, gosh, um, I don't even know how to follow on with this, but um, already I will tell you we're getting um, several messages from the chat thanking both of you for um, the vulnerability and honesty and generosity in um, you know, taking us on really such a personal journey. I, ha I have a question really for, for both of you. Um, you know, I think that the challenge from an industry standpoint, like Dr. Zoss, you know, I've, I, I consider myself extraordinarily fortunate in terms of the perspective that I have been able to bring to my job because, you know, we work and have worked really on the side of the industry interacting with patients and providers and really that whole care team. And so in, in, in a lot of ways, I've always felt, you know, um, somewhat advantaged in terms of that perspective. Whereas for, you know, many of my pharma colleagues and CRO and even technology colleagues, um, while very compassionate people, and I do believe that we are all very united with a very similar type of phenotype. I think probably everybody uh, participating in this meeting today, we are all people who kind of want to make the world a better place. But it's extraordinarily challenging when you're not in that environment, when you're not day to day walking the halls in, in a hospital or you're in a clinic or you're walking through a waiting room and you see your patient participant there with their family members, and you see that fear on people's face, right? And so what can we do? And, and when I say we, those of us who have the good fortune to be at the front line with patients, what, you know, what recommendations or strat strategies um, can you think of for us to be able to really bring that patient perspective and, and share that in a better way, you know, and not wait for pharma in the industry to come to us asking those questions, but what is it that, that we can do? So I'll start, TJ, with one a few thoughts. I mean, I think the, the story you told, TJ, about, you know, sharing that picture, right, really it's connecting to purpose, uh, right? And we're all so busy and everything we do, and it's probably harder in the Zoom world that we live, uh, to step back from the day-to-day, -day, from the tasks, from the work to say, you know, how do we, um, for all of our teams, repeatedly connect to the purpose of what we do? The other component of it is, right, this is not uh, an individual sport, it's a team sport. Uh, and our physician leaders and thought leaders, uh, right, are, are outstanding, but it, it truly is the, that healthcare ecosystem and, and that team is the patient, their family. Uh, it's everyone, even if they don't physically come in contact. Um, I'll, I'll share one example of what I do to try to connect our team. So my, my leadership team is around 330 individuals uh, and leadership roles. I connect twice a week with them, uh, again, through Zoom and WebEx uh, virtually. Uh, we start every one of those calls with connecting to purpose and story and feedback and examples from our team. And whether it's uh, our team that's leading facilities or security uh, or environmental services or my nursing and physicians, right, they're all Part of that care team um, and we truly insist that every single one of those leadership meetings we only start once we will reconnect and realize that you know we all whether clinical or non-clinical have the privilege to what we do today 
it's probably even a greater privilege in the COVID world, right? There's probably now more recognition and appreciation of healthcare and of clinical research and innovation than we've had in you know the last 20 years of my career because of the importance of both that compassionate care, the respect for healthcare workers, uh, and the respect for and the need and the hunger for right innovation and research, whether that's for new therapies, for vaccines. Um, and so I think, right, we've shown as, as a healthcare community, right, that we can be much more nimble, uh, that we can deploy clinical research much quickly than we ever have before. And we have this opportunity where the community needs us. So, right, I think there's never a greater time to say, how do you connect to purpose? How do you bring that whole team together? Um, and I think we need to be intentional to be remind people of that. Uh, otherwise, life gets too busy and we forget. I, I'm going to build on just one thing you said, two things you said there. Uh, the first one being purpose. It's one of the words I use quite a bit when I when I do talks in, in the industry. Uh, it's it, that is a it's a ground ground the team, the the company in what what that purpose is. And I think the word that goes along with that is perspective. I think we both probably changed our perspective on clinical research, Dr. Zas, you and I, and I, I'm sure Mary has has done the same, Jennifer. Uh, that the perspective, our perspective changed. Uh, Dr. Zas alluded to it very well in his in his talk, reminding the team of that perspective, whether it's having a patient talk or simply just checkpointing and saying. Are, is what we're doing going to make people's lives better? Sometimes if you're talking to the accounting team, that might not be as easy to see, uh, but you'd be surprised at how many times as, a, as an advocate and as an advisor, I've gone into teams and said, well, what are you doing to make this better for, for people you serve? Uh, you know, it's not the payers. Uh, it's not the, the, the medical facilities, but really it's, it's the population who we're trying to heal. So, for me, that is is the, the most important thing to bring to teams who maybe are, are are one one step removed or, or more more than one step removed from the clinic, and don't get to see the drastic difference in, in, in my recovery from from Alan Omer, Dr. Zas's from um, AML. They don't always understand this. What they do has that significant impact. And the more we can subtly and, and reinforce that, subtly remind them and reinforce that reminder, I think the more motivated that, that our workforce will be to see, hey, you know, what I'm doing, uh, this makes a difference. This is something that I should, I can, and I should be very proud of. I, I mean, I think you both have brought up fantastic suggestion. I mean, I think they're very pragmatic things that all of us can um, be more mindful of. And, you know, it's just showing up in a very intentional way, whether it's an internal group or even external meetings and, and sharing, right? Stories and, and these snippets of, of stories. I also want to say too, and, and I know this is, um, you know, a discussion centered around compassion and, and we've heard uh, directly from the voice of patients and on behalf of patients. But I also think that it's a moment in time right now for us to reflect and really express, express gratitude. This moment in time that we are, are living in um, is bringing forth, uh, in my mind, you know, some, some new awakenings. And just even within my own organization, um, late last week, we're involved in a significant number of COVID-19 vaccine trials. And we have had uh, recently within the past week, two team members test positive. And we have a researcher right now within, you know, my own institution that is sick. Um, now, whether where the exposure was, I don't know, but this has been somebody who's been at the front line. So, you know, again, I think it is being mindful, too, of um, just compassion all the way around. And this is... You know, research does, Dr. Zas, I could not agree with you more. I mean, research um, works at the highest level with that sense of teamwork and, you know, truly how we are all in this together. Uh, so, I, you know, it's just, it's just, I think, leaning into every opportunity that we can 
to be, um, you know, uh, uh, students as opposed to always the teacher. And, um, you know, another thing too that I wanted to just in, in the remaining time that we have, um, and I think again, in, in a COVID world right now, we are seeing the power of cooperation and collaboration. And Dr. Zoss, you know, you talked about, um, you know, the um, experience that you had between Duke and Hopkins. And I'm imagining there was some coordination in terms of care. Um, TJ, you talked about, you know, navigating your way into a trial because friends, right, kind of co collaborated, you know, to make that happen. So just would be interested in, in kind of the last few minutes that we have, maybe any thoughts that you have about how we together can do more to uh, build teamwork, cooperate, and not compete. Uh, I'll start if you want, Dr. Zas. I This is a 30-second response. It, it for me is, uh, maybe it's more than that because I talk a lot, but it is the, the, the power of thinking, especially we've seen in 2020, how we can overcome obstacles. I sat next to uh, a CRA one time on an airplane who continued to fly all the things that I thought uh, to do for patient engagement were impossible. And her words were continually started with, we can't, and then we go on for the reasons, why can't we? And then someone even asked, on top of that said, well, why not just why can't we, but how can we? And that's a mindset that, that, that I think pre-COVID was difficult to change because the way we've always done things. And now we're taking the opportunity for, uh, uh, virtual, for virtual health and telemedicine and and, and, and decentralized trials that are now becoming fairly ubiquitous. How can we, how can we as a team overcome this problem? I think you're right, Jennifer, on the importance of, of teamwork. Um, I think there will be many good things that come out of COVID, um, despite some of obviously the horrible things that have happened and the number of lives that we've lost. Um, but we have learned to collaborate differently between industry and healthcare delivery systems. We've learned to collaborate between community, state, local government, uh, and health systems. We've seen competitor hospitals, uh, again, look differently around how we work together in, in testing. And we've done all this uh, with being especially nimble compared to what we were before. And again, I think we talk about telehealth, we talk about there will be things that will be positive, that we will be better as a healthcare delivery ecosystem uh, at the other side. And, and part of that is uh, the team. Um, maybe I'll end with one last sort of short story, but I do think um, going back to my patient experience, that team is really important to the individual. And they, I don't think as the being a physician, I ever really appreciated it. So the night I got admitted, they looked out my window at Hopkins and I could see the dome that's on all the logos. And I climbed that in 1998 as an intern with one of the world's founders of human genomics, Victor McCusick, um, who really got the Presidential Medal of Honor and, and really discovered you know, innovation and precision medicine and was a national, international thought leader. And I looked at my wife in 2017 and I said, it's 20 years later, I'm gonna climb that dome again when we beat this. Uh, that evening. On July 29th, when I finally was discharged on day 55 after the bone marrow transplant, I'm fortunate that I know who has the key. And I took my care team, my bald head, my wife, my research coordinator, my physicians, some of the residents that I trained with there that were part of my care team and the support. And I have a picture sitting in my home of sitting on top of that dome, all of us wearing t-shirts to, to celebrate the, the victory with the Baltimore skyline in the background and that I fulfilled my commitment. And it wasn't just me, right? The team that allowed me to get through that. Uh, but I was committed to that promise that I made that night that I got admitted when I wasn't sure if I was gonna live or die. 
that I was going to follow through with it. Um, right. And that picture that I can so visibly see in my mind, right, sits in the house every day that I walk in and reminds me of how fortunate I've been for the compassion that I was a beneficiary of from that whole team. Uh, and, and that's where I think, right, uh, how do we ensure that every patient has that same feeling? They're not all going to be have the outcomes that TJ and I had. Being a physician, I know that. Uh, at the same point, everyone deserves that same chance. Uh, and everyone deserves that same team. So I appreciate the chance to, to share my story here today. Well, thank you for climbing that tower, Dr. Zoss, and looking out and um, sharing both of you in your own way, you know, gave us, um, gave us all, I think, a, a, at least a good glimpse. Um, so, Michael, with that now, you have the uh, dubious distinction of winding us down um, after, after that high. <laughs> well, this was such a wonderful session and such a great way to start off our conference today. I, I was taking notes and I was, I just like how often I was writing down the words patience, compassion, and perspective, which I think are the keys to this. And as you all alluded to, it's easy to forget sometimes in the day-to-day -day rigmarole, but you know, this is literally matters of life and death for people and alleviating suffering. And I can't think of a higher calling. I salute all three of you for your, your work, your vulnerability, uh, your, your, your passion. It's just, it's inspiring to see. And I think for our uh, audience, it has been as well. Um, with that, I do have to get a little pedestrian and we do have to move on to the next session, which is also important, of course, in a different way uh, at 1215. So we'll be back on in about 10 minutes, but I want to thank David and TJ and Jennifer again so much for your session and ask all of you to uh, take a quick break, have a little coffee or water or something. And we'll be back at 1215 with uh, Amanda Wright and Lynn King, who will be talking about improving alignment and risk management approaches across pharma, CRO, and site relations, important topics. And again, thank you three so much for just getting us off to such a high level, powerful start. Thank you very much.